Welcome to our podcast, Psychiatric Services from Pages to Practice. In this podcast, we highlight new research or columns published this month in the journal Psychiatric Services. I'm Lisa Dixon, editor of Psychiatric Services, and I'm here with podcast editor and my co-host, Josh Berzin. Hi, Josh. Hi, Lisa. Today, we're going to be doing an interview, which uh, Josh will tell you about. I'm very excited about this interview of one of our authors, Natalie Bonfine. I think it's going to be a great, uh, great interview of a really well-written, clear piece about the reasons why people with serious mental illness are overrepresented in criminal justice settings and what we can do about it. So we're very lucky to have Natalie Bonfine, who's an assistant professor in the Department of Psychiatry at Northeast Ohio Medical University, to come talk with us on meeting the needs of justice-involved people with serious mental illness within community behavioral health systems, an article that she wrote with Amy Wilson and Mark Munetz. So Natalie, welcome to the podcast. Thanks for joining us. Yeah, thanks for having me. I also want to point out that this article is part of the Think Bigger, Do Good series commissioned by the Thomas Scatterhood Behavioral Health Foundation, PEGS Foundation, the Patrick P. Lee Foundation, and the Peter and Elizabeth Tower Foundation. Um, And we're partnering with this series to publish some of these articles in psychiatric services, and they will also appear on the Think Bigger, Do Good website. So the article is definitely, you can see why it's in a big ideas uh, series, because it is a really, does cover some really huge ideas and and big topics. But before we jump into all that, Natalie, I think it'd be interesting for our listeners to hear a little bit more about how you got involved in this, um, this area of policy and research. Yeah, absolutely. So I am a medical sociologist, and I'm extremely interested in systems level responses to multiple factors and and issues that affect people with serious mental illness. About this particular interest, I've been working at the intersection of criminal justice and mental health for, for my career. And it's really, really challenging work, but very rewarding work. It addresses a complex issue Uh, the intersection of multiple systems, multiple perspectives. And it's really ultimately about helping the people who have serious mental illness, who have justice involvement, helping them live, work, and be in the communities where they need to be. Great. It's also an incredibly well-written article that's very easy to follow through your arguments. It seems like you're writing for not just an academic audience, but really for kind of a, a wide swath of people to really understand some of these these issues. Yeah, yeah. And it was a it was a fun but challenging piece to write because we, we had the opportunity, which doesn't always happen with academic writing, to actually kind of think bigger and describe how we would want to address this complex issue. There's the concept of the wicked problem, which has uh, been around since the 1970s, that really focuses on a a complex issue that's difficult to solve, almost impossible to solve, but something that can be tamed. The issue that we're focusing on here with this piece uh, really is one of those wicked problems. And so it was really kind of challenging, rewarding, and fun to be able to think through some of the, the ways that we might be able to if not solve, at least address uh, address that challenge. And I, I would say that we also have to thank the, the sponsorship and the leadership of the Think Bigger, Do Good group who identified this as a, this topic as a paper of interest and was very clear in the development of the topics and the development of the papers that the audience is certainly needs to go way, way beyond the academic space that we want to inf- they want to influence policymakers and citizens and people and advocates people who who can make change. Great. So let's dive into a little bit of the of the paper and one of the big background concepts that you lay out is the criminalization hypothesis. So I'm wondering if you can walk us through what the criminalization hypothesis is and kind of what you see as its some of its main limitations. 
Yeah, absolutely. So the criminalization hypothesis explains the overrepresentation of people with serious mental illness in the justice system as being due to the transinstitutionalization from mental health settings to the criminal justice system. Deinstitutionalization of psychiatric hospitals, which occurred in the United States, really led to the overburdened and underfunded community mental health services that could not keep up with the needs of those folks who were coming out of the psychiatric hospitals. And as such, symptomatic illness and related behaviors of living with serious mental illness, uh, untreated serious mental illness, such as homelessness that often accompanies that condition, it all came under the purview of the criminal justice system. As an explanation, the criminalization hypothesis suggested this kind of direct, almost hydraulic effect of removing folks from psychiatric settings and an increase in the criminal justice system. However, we know that this is not necessarily a wrong observation, but it's certainly not a complete explanation. It's an overly simplistic explanation of these mechanisms. And I just, I'll jump in and just say, I thought that that came out so well in your paper, that the limits of the transinstitutionalization notion and then, but then offering additional ways of thinking and, and con- conceptual frameworks for the, the situation we have now with so many justice involved people with serious mental illness. So now that I've interrupted you, I'm probably... Um, well, let us know. <laughs> so, so why, what is kind of, what are some alternate models? What are yeah. some kind of more nuanced explanations for why people with serious mental illness mm-hmm. are overrepresented in the criminal justice system? What's a better oh, answer than the criminalization? Yeah, well, there are, there are multiple systemic, community-level, and even individual-level forces at play with this phenomenon of the overrepresentation of people with serious mental illness in the criminal justice system, in addition to the deinstitutionalization and, and kind of transinstitutionalization from psychiatric settings to justice, criminal justice settings. Kind of at a societal level, the influence of policies that have contributed to mass incarceration in general have raised the number of people who are involved in the criminal justice setting, people with or without serious mental illness. So policies around the war on drugs, kind of these tough on crime policies that have emerged, such as the three strikes rules, determinate sentencing based on crimes, those have all increased the criminal justice population in the United States over decades. And so that is a trend that's happening. And it's a trend that's happening not just for people with serious mental illness, but people without. Exactly. So, but, it, but it's affecting people with serious mental illness. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Other kind of social systemic issues that are impacting or kind of at play in this context are, you know, structural and institutional racism, where people of color are being subjected to increased surveillance and unequal protection of the law, leading to their overrepresentation as well. And so there are these different groups in society that are being affected by these policies at kind of the macro level that are contributing to greater number of people in the criminal justice system. And so, of course, we see that people with serious mental illness are also being affected by those policies as well, since that's affecting the general population. So they're not immune to those sorts of forces as well. Other social structural factors that contribute to criminal justice involvement, like issues of poverty, people living in disadvantaged neighborhoods, these things that are kind of the social antecedents to criminal behavior as well as criminal justice involvement, are, are prevalent. And people with serious mental illness, unfortunately, often find themselves in these types of settings. They're living in disadvantaged neighborhoods. They may not be able to work. They may be living in poverty. Other factors not related to their mental illness are contributing to their involvement with the criminal justice system. I was very interested in um, in your the notion of the... Um, the crimin- criminogenic risk perspective. Right. And, and, and so I was wondering if what you've described as the, the different factors that are correlated with criminal justice or being in the 
people with SMI being in the justice system, is that are, is, are you reflecting the variables that the uh, criminogenic risk perspective has identified? Yeah, absolutely. So far, we've been describing the societal level or social level forces, policy forces that have influenced this phenomenon that we're seeing. But there are those criminal risk factors that individuals have kind of at the the individual level, the psychological level, uh, those factors that place them at risk for becoming involved in the criminal justice system. So thinking about criminal thinking and you know, antisocial behavior, thought patterns, associates hanging out with the wrong crowd. These are all risk factors that put any of us at risk for criminal justice involvement. And so you have to factor in uh, the, again, we're talking about people. People have complex needs. People with serious mental illness have clinical mental health needs. They may also have substance dependence, which needs to be addressed that substance dependence can often put them at risk for criminal justice involvement, just like it can put any one of us at risk for that, as well as some of those other criminal risk factors that really need to be considered in terms of thinking about how and why people become involved in the criminal justice system. So just to step back a second to kind of summarize where we are. So it it sounds like we know that there's an overrepresentation of people with serious mental illness in the criminal justice system. And the kind of previous idea of this criminalization hypothesis was that um, that was because of deinstitutionalization and shifting of the burden from inpatient facilities that were shut down to the criminal justice setting. But what you've just laid out is a much more complex. And I think the important thing is that our interventions were based around that idea, that idea that the problem was the shifting from psychiatric inpatient to the community. But what you've just laid out is a much more complex kind of fabric of individual societal and structural factors to explain this problem. Do I have that right so far? Yeah, absolutely. So given that, what the, you and your colleagues are arguing for is that the community mental health system can be the driver of, I don't know if I want to say solving this problem, but addressing this issue in a way that's much better matched to this more complex explanation. Do I have that right also? Yeah, I mean, I think that the community mental health system uh, really has the duty to do this. They really have the duty to address the needs of people with serious mental illness, many of whom are involved or have had involvement in the criminal justice system. So why do you think that, so there's all sorts of institutions that are involved in the care of, of this population or in addressing the some of the issues that you laid out. Why do you think the community mental health system is the kind of best situated one to be kind of taking uh, the most ownership over the problem? Yeah, so I would say that there are several reasons why behavioral health is is kind of best situated to address this issue. Um, In addition to the the duty, the legislative mandate, the the professional responsibility that we have to care for people who have serious mental illness, it's really our approach in doing so that puts us in the best position to do this. We have a history of focusing on prevention, early identification, and intervention of disorders. We recognize the importance of intervening early to stem the, the harmful trajectory of different health conditions. If you think about initiatives that focus on reducing the duration of untreated psychosis, of earlier intervention at the point of psychosis to prevent progression of schizophrenia, we have a history in the community mental health system of of doing these sorts of things in a preventive way. We have a recovery orientation, which really helps to not just abate uh, clinical mental health symptoms, but to promote recovery. It promotes well-being, living in the community setting, working, engaging in social relationships, building families leading lives. It's really about creating a whole person recovery oriented framework. And we have that perspective. So how is that different 
from what ha- the interventions that are more commonly offered now. And I, I find that the notion of the intercepts is, is quite helpful in understanding that. Yeah, absolutely. So, so the interventions that we have now to answer your, the first part mm-hmm. of your question are really focused on criminal justice settings and trying to identify and tie mental health to them. So it's thinking about who's leading those initiatives. It's often criminal justice champions, judges, sheriffs coming out and promoting jail diversion programs and alternatives in their community with the idea of connecting people with serious mental illness from the justice system to community mental health. This is, you know, a relic of the criminalization hypothesis. So it's recognizing that we need to get these folks who have serious mental illness out of justice settings and connect them to community mental health. If we do that, their symptoms will be addressed. They'll get the, the, the clinical care that they need and they won't have criminal justice involvement. As we just discussed, that's a lot more complicated than that, but it's it's something that, that I mean, it makes sense. We want to get folks out of criminal justice settings as appropriate and obviously connect them to the mental health treatment that they need. But it, it really has to be, I think, something that's driven from the community mental health system to engage them in that care. So you're not saying that, for example, criminal justice or diversion kinds of interventions are bad, right? No, absolutely not. Absolutely not. There are, there are important pieces of the puzzle that we need to have in place. What we're saying is that the community mental health system in a coordinated and integrated way can serve as essentially an ult- the ultimate intercept for preventing justice involvement as well as the best place for optimal care for people who have serious mental illness, who have criminal justice involvement. That's what I I found very also, well, very illuminating when I read your piece that the notion of sort of intercept zero or the ultimate intercept, which can pull together and and take responsibility for all the steps. And, And again, not necessarily devaluing the wonderful and, and many of effective for what they are interventions that are in the subsequent steps of, of intercept, say one, two, three, and four, uh, but that, that those, that's in, going to be insufficient. Yeah, absolutely. So in thinking about the sequential intercept model and the idea of community mental health system as this is, is intercept zero, maybe it would be helpful if I just walk through what the sequential intercept model is just briefly. Yep. So it was developed by Munitz and Griffin, and it's really a framework uh, that envisions the criminal justice system in a linear way and identifies five points of intercepts where the community mental health system and the criminal justice system can intervene, can collaborate with the goal of diverting people who have serious mental illness either from entering the criminal justice system, from progressing through the criminal justice system, and divert them instead to a community-based network of services and care that can help meet their needs, their clinical substance, uh, clinical mental health and substance use needs that they may have. The first intercept is really law enforcement, uh, police interaction. The second intercept is the initial detention and hearings that happen immediately upon an arrest. The third intercept is the jail, um, the experience of, of these folks in the jail, as well as in court settings. The fourth intercept is at the point when individuals leave correctional settings and institutions and are re-entered into the community. And then the fifth intercept is really focused on community corrections, such as probation and parole and community support. Uh, as I mentioned, the community mental health system is originally conceptualized was the ultimate intercept. There's been more recent conceptualization and focus on crisis services that prevent that initial police engagement. So the ultimate intercept kind of now conceptualizes intercept zero pre law enforcement engagement is really focusing on those community-based services, which include crisis services, to prevent criminal justice 
involvement, as well as other, you know, risks uh, that the, that these folks may have, substance dependence, trauma, social dan- disadvantage, those sorts of risks. So it's really oh. a the sequential intercept model is really a framework uh, that focuses on preventing a negative outcome, specifically focused on criminal justice involvement as that outcome. So what do you what do you think would have to change about our current community mental health system to make it a more effective intercept zero or ultimate intercept? Yeah, absolutely. So this is where we got to play around with the vision of what we would want to see happen, right? And so that's what was really kind of fun to do in writing this piece. There are a couple of things that need to happen. We think that behavioral health services would need to expand the services that they need to meet the multiple needs of these folks. So again, we talked about they may have clinical mental health needs, they may have substance use needs, they may have clinical mental health needs, they may have substance use needs, they may have criminal risk factors that place them at risk for criminal justice involvement. Um, It really is expanding the services to identify what those needs are and be prepared to meet those needs as they exist. It involves integrating services. Uh, Community mental health has a track record for integrating treatments and services. We've done it successfully in the past by integrating clinical mental health needs with substance use needs services. If you think of the integrated dual diagnosis treatment as an effective practice to address individuals who have co-occurring mental health and substance use disorders. We have success at integrating primary care and mental health care uh, to address people with comorbid physical health conditions. And we have good success and a a proven track record at integrating with social services, helping people engage in vocational services, supported employment, housing first programs that really help them uh, address those those basic social service needs that they may have. So we have a history of integrating services, but we need to do more. I think there's more that we can do to integrate services between what's offered historically in the criminal justice system and in criminal justice settings to address those criminogenic needs that folks have, but then also to kind of recognize what those other needs are and address them in an integrated way. It may also involve coordination of services, helping serve as a service coordination hub, if you will, to facilitate placement and availability of of other types of services that may need, that people may need if it can't be delivered in an integrated way. I mean, one of the things that strikes me about the what you're saying and, and what you're, you're writing in the paper is that if you could create or could improve the community mental health system so that they could fill this role, you, you wouldn't just be kind of addressing this problem. You'd also be making it serve everybody a lot better. The types of changes that you need to make to improve the community mental health system to address the criminal justice issues would make it a system that would be much more effective, I think, in serving all of our complex needs populations. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I, I think I, I often think about this saying that, you know, if you can't explain it to a six-year-old, you can't explain it. <laughs> you don't understand it. I think it was uh, an Einstein quote. But the idea of what we're talking about is very simple. It's understanding that people have multiple complex interwoven needs that place them at risk of justice system involvement. They place them so that they're, they're in need of care, of treatment. And the concept of what we're talking about is really just recognizing what those multiple needs are and providing services to meet those needs. Our argument here is that the community mental health system, behavioral health services are the best place to do that because of our orientation towards achieving recovery, towards preventing future negative outcomes, uh, the therapies, the uh, therapeutic approaches and relationships that happen in the community mental health treatment that help to create positive outcomes and and help people improve and recover. Um, Those are are factors that, that make the 
behavioral health system the best place to do this type of, of care work. So, Natalie, I have, I have a question. I, yeah. I think, as, as you indicate, and I think as it's in, reflected in the paper, this is aspirational. Um, and I, I don't think that I completely, you know, the wisdom of, of what you all argue is so profound and, and so almost obvious, like for a six-year-old, right? Right. But we, we have struggled in the mental health system and the behavioral health care system to, to be that, to provide that kind of care quality as we're talking about integrated mental health and substance use treatment. I, I think we, we have so, so far to go. I mean, we may have some ideal, uh, pl- uh, ideal programs, but I unfortunately would. I think we have to acknowledge that that the that these kinds of high quality services are still the exception rather than the rule. And so, um, and I, I mean, I'm not against uh, uh, aspiring to excellence, but I guess what I'm thinking of about, and maybe all of this introduction is a lot of blather. What would somebody Argue. What would if someone arguing the alternative to your what you're putting forward? What would they be? What would they be advocating for? Would they be advocating for more of the kinds of services that are at the uh, the the intercepts one, two, three, four, and five? That are they arguing that we would have we have better luck, a better chance of of being successful uh, within the within the, the the criminal justice system? What's the counter argument? Yeah. So. That is what we're seeing in practice. We're seeing an enhancement of services in the just in justice settings, in criminal justice settings, to address people who have serious mental illness in that moment. And those are good and powerful programs that need to be in place because that's where folks who have serious mental illness are ending up. So we're seeing that happen. So greater um, investment in those sorts of programs. Right. I think that I think that is definitely what the the counter would be. Our perspective is that is not what the criminal justice system is set out to do. It's it's not it should not be building a a separate system or a compatible system for that population. Ultimately, if if we want folks to live in recovery, it's best in community settings. People who have justice involvement are not there permanently, for the most part. Uh, they come back to communities. So we need to be able to develop and care for them in communities. Again, we've argued that, that the community mental health system has the, the training, we have the perspective to be able to do so. I don't know that we've had the funding to support the vision that we've talked about here. And hopefully that's something that can change um, over time. But the counter argument is, if it's not the community mental health system, then who? And we just don't feel that the criminal justice system should hold hold that responsibility. I think that's a really terrific kind of synthesis of this really well-written, well-argued lucid article. Thank you. Yeah. So Natalie, thanks so much for joining us. Is there anything else you wanted to make sure that we uh, we left with? No, thank you so much for having me. I think that what we need to do is challenging. It involves everyone coming together to do this. This is not a problem for the community mental health system to solve on their own. We've been talking about the complex issue. It is really a problem for everyone to solve. It is an issue for the general public to become aware of and to advocate for change in criminal justice, health and health care policies, uh, mental health services. These are all factors that influence this phenomena that we're seeing. And it's ultimately our responsibility to address it. If not us, then whom? Well, Natalie Bonfine, thank you so much for joining us. Yeah, thank you so much for having me. Appreciate it. Wow, a lot to think about. That's it for today. We invite you to visit our website, ps.psychiatryonline.org. 
to read the article we discussed in this episode, as well as other great research. We also acknowledge the production assistance of Demery Jackson, Michael Pogachar, and Ephraim Tukabo. Thank you very much. A, a long overdue thank you. Yes, indeed. They do a lot of work to make us sound um, sound a lot better than we actually do. <laughs> yeah, it's uh, humbling. <laughs> We remind you to check out the Editor's Choice Topic Collections, available now. Sign up at appi.org slash E-T-O-C-S. That's E-T-O-C-S. The recent collections have focused on family needs in serious mental illness, and we have one coming out on crisis. We invite your feedback. We welcome it. Please email us at psjournal at psych.org. I'm Lisa Dixon. I'm Josh Bearson. Thank you for listening. We'll talk to you next time. Have a great holiday.